Get ready for a transformative experience with Divine Renovation Ministry. Here, Catholic leaders, parish innovators, and passionate believers unite to inspire change and strengthen our faith. Experience inspiring talks, spiritual renewal, and meaningful connections. Together, we'll explore how to ignite the fire of faith in our communities and embrace the future of our church. It starts here with us. Catholic Parish Summit 2024. I'm here at the Catholic Parish Summit in Harrogate and I'm joined here with Sister Miriam James Highland. Sister Miriam, you're going to be speaking to us on the topic of made in God's image, healing and leadership. Can you share with us the message that you're hoping to communicate? Yeah, the message I'm hoping to communicate is really an encounter with God's love. And I really believe as leaders, um, we can only accompany people to the degree we are willing to go with Jesus within our own hearts and our own stories. And so the leader has to go first and the leader has to be willing to go to very deep places and do hard things. And so we, it's imperative among us that we, um, yeah, that we really want to encounter the Lord and allow Him to continue to heal our hearts so that we can make a gift of ourselves and reveal His presence. Because people are hungry for His presence. They're not hungry for programs. They're hungry to, to encounter Christ, and that's what's happening within our hearts. Yeah. From your ministry, Sister Miriam, what do you see as one of the one of the main barriers that gets in the way of that healing and leadership? Uh, I think a lot of times our understanding of our sorrowful mysteries in our life that many times are never talked about. Um, they're never encountered with love and kindness. Uh, a lot of times we have a lot of shame, a lot of secrets, a lot of unconfessed sin, and those just create barriers because then we have to distance ourselves from the people that we serve or even fracture within ourselves. And so allowing people to um, encounter the Lord in kindness and compassion and truth and honesty is what frees us. And that's what happens in the Gospels. Um, people's masks come down and Christ encounters them in love and truth and their lives are changed. And that's a lifelong process. There's no magic formula. There's no. There's no quick way through that. That is, that's the transformation into Christ, and that's what we're. That's what we're about. If we're not, we're about that. I don't know what we're doing. So, yeah. That sounds amazing. I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Welcome, you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Would you fall afresh? Would you speak through Sister Miriam? Would her words be your words? And Lord, would we encounter you so deeply tonight? We pray this in your most holy and glorious name. Amen. 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 So what we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna speak about this evening is we're gonna speak about healing and leadership, and we're gonna talk about we're gonna take a, a step along Hannah's journey that she laid out for us this evening or yesterday evening about Genesis, and we're gonna speak tonight about healing and leadership, but being made in the image and likeness of God, and it's just really wonderful being among you in, in especially in the ministry of divine renovation. And I was just thinking also of how there's many ministries present here, and my you know the several ministries that I work with in the United States, and I just had this vision of a vineyard. And all of us are in the vineyard. And you know, there's one vine and there's many branches and all of us are in this, in this vineyard. But because all of us work together in the vineyard, we might work in different rows of the vineyard. But whether it's Encounter Ministries or Unbound Ministries or Divine Renovation or Amazing Parish or the John Paul II Healing Center or Friends of the Bridegroom, there's Focus Ministries, there's so many. It's like we're all in the, in the deep well of the vineyard and we're in Christ's vineyard and we're all cross-pollinating. And the receptivity of what you're doing at Divine Renovation is so inspiring for me and what I do. And we need each other, don't we? We need each other. And it's so wonderful that we can see people's mission and their vision and their goal and press them toward that in our part of the vineyard. And then we can call upon other people to help us, to link arms with other people that can help us in different parts of the vineyard. And I really think that's the kingdom of God. And when, when we, we speak about healing and leadership and being made in the image and likeness of God, I just, I want to just first offer to your heart the frame of reference to which we look. Because we look at being made in the image and likeness of God, but that's a look toward eternity. So Paul, can you pull my first slide? I've been reading the, um, the encyclical, rereading God is Love recently. And I love the quote by Pope Benedict where he says that love looks to the eternal. Love's face is, is pointed toward the eternal. And he says this, he says, love embraces the whole of existence in each of its dimensions, including the dimension of time. It could hardly be otherwise since its promise looks toward its definitive goal. Love looks toward the eternal. Love indeed is ecstatic. It is ecstasy, it goes beyond itself. 
And so you and I, as we begin this journey, what we're doing is we're looking toward the eternal. Our face is toward Jesus. We're looking toward the eternal. Even the people that you're welcoming into your parish, it's not just welcoming into your parish so they can stay in your parish. You're preparing them for heaven. We're gathering a great multitude and you and I are running to heaven together. And what we're experiencing now in this transformation is we're experiencing heaven on earth where you and I can come together in our brokenness, when you and I can come together in our honesty, when you and I can come together in the places that we're not perfect and we still have questions and we can bring our gifts and our desires and our talents and all the dreams we have and we can point them toward to heaven and we run together. Love is indeed, it looks toward the eternal. And this is, this is the deepest ache of our heart, which is why, and I, I know you're very familiar with a, a beloved author to your area for many of you who live in the UK, C.S. Lewis. And I think one of the most beautiful depictions of heaven I've ever read is in a children's series called The Chronicles of Narnia. And at the very end, it's a seven, it says, the book is seven, or there's seven books in that series. And I believe he wrote it for his goddaughter. And in the preface, he tells her that one day you'll be old enough for fairy tales again, right? And at the very end of the series, I won't spoil it for you, but you should read it if you haven't, just saying, okay? So, but at the very end of the series, in the final battle, the children, the children who've had these adventures in Narnia and Aslan is, is, a, is a lion and he's the Christ figure and he's confronting them and he's bringing the truth to them and he's, he's reminding them when they've forgotten of why they're there. He's, it's just like Jesus. And they come into Aslan's land and from that moment, C.S. Lewis paints a depiction of heaven that just, just pierced my heart from the first time I read it. And he said, heaven, as the children enter into Aslan's land, it just gets to be more and more beautiful. And he says this, heaven is like a book which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and in which every chapter is better than the one before. You and I ache for that. Every single human person you know aches for that. The people that you're bringing into your parishes, the people don't, that don't want to come into your parishes, the people in your family that you haven't talked to in 20 years, they ache for it. You and I ache for the eternal. We ache for a never-ending beauty and a never-ending communion and a love that will last forever, which is why every fairy tale in the Western world ends with what? And they lived happily ever after. That's a Christian vision. Did you know that? That's a Christian vision. That's a, it's a Christian lens. We want to live happily ever after. In our hearts, we desire to do that. So helping us understand that uh, we're on a healing journey. You and I are on a healing journey. I was mentioning in the, in the workshop earlier today that you and I are on a healing journey, which I'm going to frame for you. You and I are on a healing journey so that our hearts become like Christ. We are not on a healing journey to get back into control. We're not on a healing journey to fix ourselves or to fix the people that we live with, <laughs> even though we'd like to. We're not on a healing journey so you can stop, then you won't hurt me anymore. I'll just figure out how to manage you so then you can't hurt me anymore. That is not Christ. That is, the way he lives is just breathtaking. He's so beautiful. He's so beautiful. And how he lives. Like he, su he suffers and his heart isn't hardened and he's not crude and he's not cynical and he's not sarcastic and he's not passive aggressive. <laughs> he's just tenderly strong. And he tells the truth and he tells it with love. And he brings us into the eternal to where the love never ends, where it lasts forever. And in our hearts, Father Mellon was today was speaking very beautifully about what happens in our hearts. Why is it that you and I, and we talk about original sin and you can talk about concupiscence and you can talk about rupture, which wounds are a rupture of love. That's what sin is. Sin is a rupture of love. Wounds are a rupture of love and sin causes wounds and we often sin out of our wounds. So every single person this side of heaven in what John Paul II would call historical man, we all experience wounds. We all have ruptures of love and we can admit that. It's okay. I think sometimes it's very um, difficult for us to even admit that our families weren't perfect or that our religious communities aren't perfect or maybe our presbyterates aren't perfect. <laughs> maybe our parishes aren't. It's, it's okay. We, we can admit that. That's the common human condition. And every single person you know, as they ache for heaven, every single human person you know, no matter what they present like on the surface, no matter how many academic degrees they have, no matter high, how highly esteemed they are in society, every single human person that you know, myself included, has a whole well of joyful mysteries, of luminous mysteries and glorious mysteries. And every single person that you know has a whole well of sorrowful mysteries. And we usually spend our entire life running away from our sorrowful mysteries because we're convinced that those are what make us unlovable. 
So we craft very elaborate fig leaves, right, to cover those places. And Jesus doesn't wear fig leaves. And he has no pretenses, he has no masks. And it's gloriously unnerving, isn't it? <laughs> Father Jacques Philippe, if you wanna pull that slide up for me, um, Paul, Father Jacques Philippe says, it's only intimate contact with the heart of Jesus that can heal the hardness of the human heart. All of us have places that our hearts are hard, myself included. And it is only intimate contact with the heart of Jesus that heals the hardness of the human heart. It is not a five-step workshop. It is not seven days to a better you. <laughs> it's not outperforming it. It's actually only intimate contact with the heart of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there are days that I wish there was another way. Because intimate contact with the heart of Jesus means that my heart has to be open and that I have to be honest about my desires, you know, it's, it's, and, my, and my sins and the places that I struggle. And it's, I think it's one thing to talk about sin or we talk about our brokenness, but you know what? I think underneath that is a very tender place when we start talking about our desires. Have you ever named a desire and somebody made fun of it? They said it was stupid? Or like, that can't possibly happen. What a waste of time. Well, they just shut it down. Or maybe you were a little girl or a little boy and different cultures have different ways of, of different ways of kind of managing areas of our life that are painful. So we talk about trauma, which is trauma is the Greek word for wound, right? So rupture. So every society also has different ways of, of managing wounds. And for some, some societies, let it all hang out and they're just very open. And some societies say, well, you got to keep a stiff upper lip. Stand up straight. Don't let anybody see you cry. You got to keep going. Don't be weak. And that's a, that's, that's a way to survive. That's a way to survive trauma. It's a way to survive catastrophic areas of our life where we have nobody to talk to, but that's not a way to live. And I just don't see Jesus living like that. I don't see him. Like he's a man. Jesus is a man who's appropriately moved. Like Father was saying earlier that he's moved to his bowels. He's moved to his kidneys. He's moved. He is appropriately moved. So he rejoices, he grieves, he sorrows, he gets angry. He's angry at the Pharisees' hardness of heart with the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. They won't heal him. And the scripture says, looking around, grieved at, their heart, grieved at their hardness of heart, Christ heals him. Jesus is not indifferent to your sufferings. He's deeply moved by them. And the things that have happened to you that should have never happened to you, they are not okay with him. They are not okay. And I remember many years ago, I was listening to a lecture by Dr. Jordan Peterson, if you're familiar with him. He's a Canadian um, clinical psychologist and a professor, and he travels the world. And just a fascinating human being who just became famous for telling the truth. And I remember many years ago, I was listening to a lecture that he gave, and he would give these, he, he's, I don't know if he does this anymore, but he would give these two-hour-long philosophical lectures, and he would answer a live Q&A. And at the end, the, they had a time for Q&A, and one of the people said, Dr. Peterson, you know, what have you learned in 20 years of being a clinical psychologist, of, you know, writing a best-selling books and now speaking to millions of people across the world? Like, what have you learned? And it was very interesting because Dr. Peterson got very quiet, and then he said, what I've learned is this. No one gets away with anything. Nobody. And then he said, you know, if you've done something that's wrong and you're not admitting to it and you don't want to face it, he said, you're not getting away with it. It's eating you alive. And he said, if you have unhealed wounds, if you have unforgiveness in your heart and you think you're getting away with it by not forgiving the person who's hurt you, he said, he said, it's eating you alive too. And these things make our hearts hard. And just to tell you, it is understandable where your heart has hardened. Because when our hearts hardened, it's trying to protect something very vulnerable underneath. And Jesus has no desire to come and rip away your self-defense mechanisms, to kick down your walls, to, to tail, to, you know, Jesus does not come to violate you. He comes to be with you, and his presence is deeply invitational. And so under, what happens, understandably so, is that you and I in our life, when we've experienced ruptures of love and we've experienced sorrow in our life, we harden our hearts to get the pain to stop. We've all done that. We're like, I just don't want to be hurt anymore. And maybe we've been disappointed. We've all, that's a common human experience. Then we feel shame about that. And then, you know, as we become leaders, we become leaders. And then we notice that there's deeper things within us. And then it's really a deep temptation. Let me tell you, the higher up you go on the leadership ladder, it is the deeper temptation to hide your vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Because then it's like, oh my gosh, I'm a leader of a mission. How can I, how can I admit to this? How can I admit that I'm struggling? How can I admit that I have these sorrows or secrets? Or how can I admit that I don't know? Even just saying, sometimes I don't know. <laughs> There's a great saying that we don't know what we don't know. 
until we know, you know, then you know. <laughs> I, says, I don't know. Like, there's a bunch of stuff I don't know. And sometimes just for us to admit, I don't, I don't know. Or I'm sorry, I, ma- I made a mistake. Not you made... I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. That was my stuff. I'm so sorry. I, I missed your heart there. Can we try again? I, I want to learn. I want to understand where you're coming from. I'm so sorry. And it's that act as that encounter with the love of Jesus that transforms our hearts. Because when we talk about healing, we're not talking about the kind of extraordinarily, extraordinarily kind of like miracles and things like that. That certainly does happen. But when we're talking about the ordinary work of grace, the ordinary work of healing, Here's a very simple definition for you. Healing is an ongoing encounter with God's love that brings us into wholeness and communion. Healing is an, on, an ongoing encounter with God's love that brings us into wholeness and communion. And I don't know anybody in my life who couldn't use an ongoing encounter with God's love. The places of our hearts, sometimes we say, I don't, I don't need healing. That's for the people that are really broken. I don't need healing. My, it was, we don't need to do that. But you and I desperately need an ongoing encounter with God's love that brings us into wholeness and communion. Wholeness within ourselves, communion with God and with others. And that's what Jesus desires to do. And because the Lord lives outside of time, there's no part of your life that he's not present to. You and I live in chronological time. We live in chronos. So right right now it's 8.06 and 20 seconds. (laughs) And then God willing, we come back, you know, 24 hours from now, wherever you're going to be, it's going to be 806 and 20 seconds the next day on Friday. You and I live in Kronos, but God lives in the fullness of time. We call it Kairos. He lives in the eternal now. So every single one of our life experiences from the time we were conceived until the time now, and even into heaven for all eternity, it's all continually present before God. So a healing journey is not about you and I digging up the past. or try, I, I, You don't have to dig up anything. I promise you, your pressing symptoms are already with you. They are. We don't have to dig up anything. The Holy Spirit is so kind. He's so kind. And so what we're doing in our life, my dear friends, especially as leaders, oh, especially as leaders, we must be about this journey. And people sometimes ask me, how did, you, how did you end up here in the UK? Like, how did you end up here talking? Like, how did you end up in this ministry? I ended up in this ministry because 20 years ago, I had an interior breakdown. And I was in my late 20s, and I had tons of responsibility. And I'm somebody who, I'm very type A. I'm very German, German heritage. I like things at right angles and on time. Thank you very much. And I was in a situation that was, so, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for this. I was in a situation 20 years ago that pressed so deeply upon me, I could no longer run from myself. And I remember sitting in our little hallway where we had a chapel and I had my head against the wall and I'm professed a year and a half and I'm in charge of this mission and all these things are happening. I didn't have any skills at all. I didn't, and we just didn't talk about these things as kids. I don't know if your families did, but we didn't talk about this when I was a kid. And I didn't know what to do. And I just remember putting my head against the wall and just looking at Jesus and the monster and and thank God, thank, I'm so grateful for this. I just looked at Jesus and said, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I can't go on. I can't, I can't do this. I can't go on. And I don't know what to, I didn't know, have any idea what to do. And like in my religious community, we talked a little bit about human development and things like that, but we didn't, we didn't have like what we have now. Our community has a lot of amazing things now. We didn't have that. And just the Lord used that one open door and he just started to lead me. And the, all, like, I had all this ch- un- childhood trauma that had been unhealed. And if you would have asked me, I would have told you I was fine. But I had just gaping wounds of, of childhood sexual abuse, of sexual violation, of addiction. I was conceived out of wedlock. I was given up for adoption. I was put in a foster home. Like, I mean, and if I would have told you that, that's, I can say this with great compassion, I would have told you that I was fine. And I'm, I'm a sister now. And in the sound of music, you get a guitar and everything's okay. <laughs> you know? And that, that was not what was happening in my life. And I know enough to know. I don't know very much, but I know enough to know that's not what's happening in anybody's life. And it's okay that we can admit that because the Lord loves to be with us there. He's not afraid of that. He's not, he's not disappointed in you. He's not asking you to get it together. He's not asking you to keep a stiff upper lip and just carry on. He's just asking you to be open to him so he can come and encounter you. And wherever you find yourself, he's, he's not embarrassed. And we, we want to be well, don't we? We want to live in eternity. We want our hearts to be well. We want to love well. We all have situations in our life where we want to love somebody better in our parish or in our ministry or in our families. And we say to ourselves, okay, that didn't go so well, but tomorrow, okay, I'm I'm really going to (laughs) try. I'm not going to say that thing to that person. And then the next day they come back and you say that thing. 
And they're like, man, what's wrong with me? And the truth is, there's nothing wrong with you. We have places that have yet to receive the kindness of God's love and to have his truth brought in there and all that is happening. And Jesus is not afraid of any of it. It's, and it's very beautiful. I love in the Gospel of John, um, chapter 5, one of my favorite passages that Jesus, you know, comes to the man who's paralyzed and he's been there for 38 years. And I love Jesus is so funny. He's just, I love, he just, he's so great. And I just love that he approaches the man and he asks him, you know, do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? And I mean, like, 38, bro, guys like, bro, man, 38 years. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Look, and it's just wonderful because he starts to give Jesus excuses. And I don't know about you, but I have situations in my life to this day because the healing journey, we don't just arrive. We are on a healing journey and we can never, we can never arrive in the amount of humility and beauty and goodness and forgiveness and kindness and Christ-likeness. And we can never be too much like Jesus. And that's the journey. I hope I never say to Jesus, that's enough. I hope I never say that because the day that I do, that's the day my heart starts to die. But I wanna give him full access to every part of my life. Lord, you can visit any part of my life at any time. You are most welcome because I want to be well. I want to have a heart like you that just loves and that is honest and good and kind and forgiving and humble and beautiful and steadfast. We have, all of us have those places of our hearts and then I think all of us as well, when Jesus comes to us and he says, do you want to be well? I know there's parts of me that's like, can I think about that and get back to you? Because I kind of like that little grudge. Like it's really kind of comfortable for me. And I don't want to forgive that person. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think. And the Lord's like, okay, <laughs> okay. If you're familiar with the chosen, it's this very scene where Jesus is going to come and encounter the paralyzed man. And he's yes. going to encounter the man. He's going to engage them. And the man's going to start to make excuses just like you and I do. And Jesus is just going to keep calling him back saying, you look here, you look here, you look here. This is what's most important. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know where you need the kindness of the Lord's love, but I know every single one of us does. I know that I do. And would it be okay with you? Can I just pray with you for a few moments? Just allow the Lord to just to open whatever he wants to open and just to bring that to the surface. And then we'll just allow Jesus to encounter you here, if that's okay with you. So I'm just going to invite you to make yourself comfortable and just to set down anything you might have in your hands. And once again, let's take a deep breath all the way in and just breathe all the way out. So Jesus, I just pray that you would meet us here with your kindness, that you would open our hearts, Lord, and you would just give us the grace and the courage just to be open to your kindness. I pray that you would just wrap us in your love and in your understanding and in your goodness. And I'd just like to invite you, my dear friends, in your heart, just to allow the Holy Spirit to surface just something in your heart that's been troubling for you lately, maybe something difficult. And it could be a situation happening in your parish or your diocese or Maybe it's something you've been struggling with. Maybe you've been struggling with an addiction for a long time that you've never told anybody. It could be lies you believe about yourself that you just don't belong. No matter what you do, it's not going to make a difference. But just notice. So just Holy Spirit, I just pray for each one of us here that you would just bring to mind an area of our life that's been difficult for us. And we're just going to invite you to gently keep breathing while we do this. And just to allow yourself to really take an inventory of that situation of why it's so painful. And just be very honest with no judgment. Why is that situation so painful? And just to allow yourself to feel the difficulty of that in all of its ways. And we're just going to invite you to notice, and I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would help us here. I'm just going to invite you to notice what you're believing about yourself in that situation, in that sorrowful mystery. And just be very honest about what you're believing, and it could be many things. Things like, I'll never be well, this is not going to work. I'm stupid, I can't figure it out. I'm not good enough. I'm a fraud. I'm rejected, I'm abandoned. Just notice, so Holy Spirit, I pray for each one of us, you just bring to mind what we're believing about ourselves and that distressing and that sorrowful mystery of our life. Just allow your heart to experience that in the depth of it.
And you can also notice maybe how young you feel right there. Sometimes these places bring about very young places within us. So just notice if you feel an age that's different than the one you are right now. And just notice you might feel, it doesn't have to be the exact age, you might feel like a little kid or a teenager. Just notice if that's part of it. And in that sorrowful mystery of your life, what is your desire there? What is your desire for her love there? What do you want? And I just ask you, Jesus, in this very tender place, that you would just reveal yourself however you wish, that you would just reveal yourself somewhere here, Lord. And what do you want us to know about ourselves in this sorrowful mystery, Lord? What is the truth? And I would just like to invite you, my dear friends, in that tender place, in that very holy place, that sacred place of your heart, if you'd just be willing to offer to Jesus the lies you believe about yourself. And maybe they are really comfortable. But would you be willing this evening in a new way just to offer those to him? And would you be willing today to offer him the desires of your heart? and all that you hope for. Lord, I just pray for deep healing here, deep healing in the heart of every son and daughter that so deeply belong to you, Lord, that you care for, that you care about, that you are kind to. Lord, I pray that this evening we would experience just the the beautiful river of your love, (laughs) that you would refresh us, Lord, that you would just wash away so many places of our hearts that have long been hard and cold. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that as we welcome you this evening, that our hearts would be warmed by your communion. And we offer everything to you tonight, Jesus, in your holy name. So we're here in Harrogate for the Catholic Power Summit. Where are you joining us from? So I'm originally from Glasgow. I live in London and I've driven up from Luton. And what's been your highlight so far of what you've heard? I just find it really encouraging that um, there's so many things to do in the church. There's so much needs out there, but at the same time, uh, several of the speakers have touched on being sober about not being able to do everything and uh, to be able to look at the things that we need to give up doing as well as taking on new things. Um, And also, Michelle Moran was saying this morning about, um, yeah, being able to give up things that are good in order to do things that are even better. So I found that reassuring. Is there anything in particular that's came to your heart when you're here now? Like, what what do you feel that you're calling to let go of? Well, I was as Father Stephen, who's actually my parish priest, was preaching at Mass. He was saying, if if you haven't invited anyone to a, a new parishioners event or an Alpha or something in the last year, then that's something you really need to look at. And that really that really convicted me. So I'm already thinking going back to my parish um, and over the next year, how I can invite others into the church and. Yeah, and it's so it's only so good doing everything behind the scenes and enjoying the life we have, but we need to invite others in as well. So that's amazing. And so you're in a parish that's actually living out a lot of this, a lot of these principles. Tell me what what really strikes your heart with your parish. What is it you love about your parish at the moment? So I'm involved in men's ministry. Um, so me and another another Glaswegian are run the men's group in our men's men in Saint Elizabeth's which is really good. There's about eight, nine, ten men. We meet every two weeks, every three weeks on average across the year to support each other and to grow. Um, And I think that's a real need, um, not just for leaders, but actually for people to support the leaders themselves so that they don't burn out and so that we can have a sustainable renewal in the church. That sounds so good. And so we've got a couple of days left of the conference. Mm. What are you looking forward to? Um, So... I'm only here till tomorrow, but I'm really looking forward to just catching up with different people from different countries. I just met a guy from the Netherlands there. Um, we're going to catch up later. Um, yeah, just hearing what how different people are responding to different challenges. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking forward to some good, some good worship music as well later to get renewed myself, get topped up myself.
10 years of sharing the peace of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.